Karen Lafayette, and I represent the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council. Um, I'm a native Vermonter, lifelong Vermonter, even though I come from the city of Burlington. <laughs> and my claim to fame is that uh, my grandfather was mayor of the city of Burlington, and there's an old coal-fired generating station um, that is named after him, the Moran plant on the waterfront. <coughs> And um, that served the city for about uh, 30 years, and it was decommissioned in 1985. But it seems there's always a certain cost when you're talking about energy. So um, we know that we can do it better. Um, the Vermont Low Income Advocacy Council is a statewide board of individuals representing the interests of low income Vermonters in matters of budgetary and policy before the Vermont State Legislature. VILIAC is committed to advancing those programs and those policies that promote economic security and human rights for all Vermonters. Through the Council's advocacy, VILIAC has been giving a voice to the poor, the elderly, those living with disabilities, and low-income working families in the policy-making arena of state government. Our advocacy in the legislature is about achieving a balance, maintaining a safety net for the poor and disenfranchised, and to stabilize individuals and families and promote and invest in those programs and policies that remove barriers, that provide opportunities for folks to achieve economic independence. 60 to 70,000 Vermonters live in poverty. Many more with low incomes struggle as well. Uh, home energy costs have become uh, an unbearable burden for many Vermonters. Households and the, uh, the households uh, that the lower incomes have a higher percentage of that income that they pay to stay warm. The number of folks who live in fuel poverty has grown dramatically in the past 13 years, from 71,000 in 2000 to 125,000 in 2012. One in five Vermonters is fuel poor, defined as those who spend more than 10% of their monthly income on energy savings. The past number of years has only made it even more apparent that we need to continue investing in the long-term solutions for our energy needs and affordability through efficiency, especially for low-income Vermonters. Vermont's proposed carbon pollution tax, H412, is designed to incentivize Vermonters to reduce their use of greenhouse gas um, emitting fuel the bill would establish a tax that would be assessed on uh, distributors of fossil fuels within the state. Taxes, including those that would come with a carbon pollution tax, can be regressive and can negatively affect low-income individuals who spend a higher percentage of their income on taxes compared to other income levels. We do, and we have in the past, supported similar sales taxes if we believe that the benefits outweigh the additional burden. There are economic considerations. Um, Low-income Vermonters are no different than most Vermonters. They want to make their homes more comfortable and save money on heating bills by weatherizing. They'd like to drive higher mileage vehicles and spend less on gas. They'd like to go solar if doing so wasn't prohibitively expensive up front and would save them money in the long run. Many low-income Vermonters want to participate in energy efficient choices and recognize the importance of the environment as an issue, but for the most part, their lives are all about economics. Low-income people don't have enough money not to buy the basics, safe, affordable housing, health care, food, clothes, transportation. The conversation becomes different with this particular population that is already overburdened, underemployed, struggling to make ends meet, and can't afford the basics to begin with. So the Energy Independent Vermont proposal <coughs> is prioritizing low-income Vermonters and working families whose living on fixed incomes helps them participate um, in clean energy future. Um, we are participating in that discussion, and we have been working with the Energy <coughs> Coalition to find the best ways to mitigate the carbon pollution tax increase and the cost to low-income Vermonters who cannot absorb that increase. And even more complicated, how to deliver this benefit in the fairest, most efficient way without sacrificing equity. We also have an interest in how the benefit can come back to the greater community 
and what types of programs can benefit all Vermonters. Things like weatherization, public transportation, cash for clunkers, energy efficient vehicles, maybe even sustainable funding for lighting. Um, the components of the legislation are that 90% uh, for tax credits and re uh, rebates, including um, specific dollar amounts put towards reducing the state's sales tax, which is a regressive tax, and 40% of the main revenue in this section would put towards employee rebates for employers. The remaining 60% would put towards individuals' rebates for taxpayers. Three quarters of this amount divided up and returned to all Vermonters as a tax credit. One quarter of this amount um, is an extra benefit uh, and a rebate to low-income Vermonters below the 200% of the federal poverty level. And 10% are put into funds for home weatherization assistance and Vermont, the Vermont Energy um, uh, Independence Fund for the development of clean energy resources. So we feel that um, the legislation does need to address certain things. Um, the most obvious way to mitigate the increased burden on low-income Vermonters is to exempt them from the additional tax on their heating and transportation fuels. Although some have advocated for that, a good number of folks, including Biliac, representing low-income Vermonters, have chosen to find a way that low-income Vermonters can participate in achieving energy efficiency utilization of renewable energy, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and reducing energy burdens through the implementation of the carbon pollution tax. In order to do that, we need to create policies that don't, do, does not further increase their energy burden cost, and that allows them to afford to make energy efficient choices and benefit from the economic and practical benefits that this revenue would provide. Uh, it is left in the legislation for the Commissioner of Taxes in consultation with the Secretary of Human Services to determine the manner in which this rebate is delivered to eligible taxpayers. Um, and um, as we all know, um, the devil is in the details. So that's what we have been working on. What is the amount of the benefit? Who gets what? How is it delivered? And how often is it delivered? How reflective is it? of increases based on actual consumption. The more sophisticated these parameters, the more complicated it is to deliver, and probably not practical to administer. So there are, those are the items that need to be addressed, but we believe there's different levels and that we can achieve something that is fair and equitable. Um, some of the main pieces of that, without getting too detailed, are is that the benefit level must be consensitized and it must be graduated. Those with lower incomes get a higher benefit um, with numerous segments like the LIHEAP benefit. Um, there should not be a cliff created. Um, there shouldn't be a drop off after 200% of the federal poverty level. There should be some tapering off. We would encourage folks to look at higher than 200% of the federal poverty level um, because at that point, um, when someone reaches 200% of the poverty level, that's still a very low income, um, and all of your other benefits drop off at that point. Um, so you don't, you no longer uh, would, would be getting um, um, low income weatherization, you wouldn't be getting crisis fuel, you wouldn't be getting food stamps, um, you wouldn't be getting light. Um, and uh, the um, health care subsidies go up to at least 300%. Um, of the federal poverty level. So whether it's a poverty level or quintiles of income, um, we'd like to see that that taper off um, and that it be higher than 200% of the federal poverty level. Um, the other thing is that the benefit has to be reflective to the extent possible of actual consumption. There's, um, uh, there's a difference in increased heating costs and transportation costs between an elderly couple household um, that just is paying the increased cost for heat and a working family that's paying not only increased costs for heating their homes but a transportation cost when they drive 85 miles to work um, in an old truck. So to the extent that we can um, mitigate that difference. Um, the delivery of the benefit, um, is it households or is it individuals? 
Um, there's a couple of ways to deliver it. We could do an electronic benefit card. Um, we could have an immediate benefit um, uh, that, that, that would give an immediate benefit that could be added to the card monthly, quarterly. Um, we might want to consider separating heating and transportation benefit. Um, uh, but then there's a the question about is there a stigma attached to the EBT card. More and more Vermonters are using it and it's very, very similar to a credit card. Um, we are in the process of putting our LIHEAP benefits on an EBT card, um, but that has been delayed for um, um, uh, at least a year. Um, do we do an income tax uh, credit? Many low-income Vermonters don't file taxes. Um, also, that would only come once a year. So we could do a refundable income tax credit, like the earned income tax credit. Um, we could do a direct rebate to a bank account. That might be preferable for elders. Um, and, and the cash benefit should be able to be spent on anything. Um, so the, the other thing is that we, we have to be mindful that this benefit not interfere or, or uh, reduce other folks' um, um, assistance, um, like LIHEAP or other assistance programs. Um, the additional community benefits we're very interested in. We're focusing um, very hard on the legislature this year um, with the help of Tony's committee and others in the legislature to um, make sure we are able to maintain a very robust low-income weatherization program. Um, the state raises its own, own, its own tax dollars to do that. Um, if there was a sustainable, predictable funding mechanism like a carbon pollution tax uh, that would be earmarked for this program, that would be tremendous. Um, and we would be supportive of that. Um, so sustaining low-income weatherization, public transportation options, affordable fuel-efficient cars, um, and, and possibly some other benefits. Um, the tax must be well explained. We must put resources into outreach, how to apply, how to receive benefits, um, and we must have the IT in the state to accomplish it because that keeps us from doing a lot of things very well. So <clears throat> we're working very, very closely with, uh, energy, uh, with, uh, with the um, uh, uh, campaign, with the Carbon Pollution Tax Campaign, uh, and we look forward to um, developing language and legislation that will uh, take care of these, these things that we, we think need to happen and, and makes this um, an equitable situation with a very, very positive outcome. Um, the, uh, if anybody's interested, Middlebury College students just participated in, in um, a project where they looked at the effects on low-income people and they did a very good job. Um, they included many of those scenarios that you saw Sandy um, uh, speak to. Um, and um, uh, the carbon pollution tax campaign is also, uh, as the Middlebury students did, um, is going out into the community and speaking to different groups. and. Um, we're, we're looking forward to continue to work with them, and um, we're hopeful for a good solution.